All right, well, thank you for the invitation to talk about um, visualizing our library services here at The Ohio State University. I just wanted to introduce myself so that you know the uh, the face behind all the chatter here. My name is Sarah Murphy. I coordinate assessment here at The Ohio State University Libraries. I'm also an associate professor, and here's my contact information if you have any questions for me after today's session. And um, also, here's the URL for my um, Tableau public page if you want to check it out. Uh, you can just type in library viz at OSU in Google and it should appear right at the top of the search results. Before I get started though, I wanted to address a question I commonly get when I go out and talk about Tableau. And that's why do you use Tableau? How did you become interested in it? Why should I consider using Tableau at my institution? So I've been a Tableau user since June of 2012. I found Tableau kind of accidentally through a book called Now You See It. And I was really just interested in learning more about data visualization. And I found that all of the visualizations and the figures that I really liked in that book were created in Tableau. And so I went to the Tableau's website and I learned that I could do a two-week trial for free. I downloaded the program, I started playing with it, and then I like cleared off my schedule for two weeks and only played with Tableau because I just saw so much potential and utility for the project. So what's neat about Tableau is that you don't need a programming background or a high-level analyst background to use the software and create some really cool visualizations. It's the the software truly does shift ownership of your creative analytic work to the average Joe. I like that it the software has an incredible potential to support data-informed decision-making and a culture of assessment in libraries. And I really appreciate the flexibility um, the software provides for joining up different data sets that you wouldn't normally be able to make communicate with one another, um, but you can make them communicate together in Tableau so that you can get a much richer data analysis or um, picture of your data. Another question I'm asked is, well, and I think this is related to justifying a purchase for Tableau and more, but why, why use Tableau? Why can't we just use Excel or Access or another tool to visualize data? And my, my response to that is one size does not fit all. I still use Access, Excel, all these other tools that are listed up here, Open Refine. It really depends on your project. Tableau works really well for some projects, not for others. Sometimes I will pull data into Tableau so that I can blend it together and then export it out of Tableau and, and manipulate it in Excel. It really is just project dependent. Um, so with all that, I just, since this in the spirit of works in progress, I just wanted to dive right in and by giving a quick overview of some projects that I've already spoken about in other webinars and then moving on to some some new projects that are really in a, a rough state right now. So I apologize ahead of time. Um, I'm going to go to library viz at OSU in my general web browser, and I need to share my screen to do that. So where do I share screen? I, here we go, share my screen. Hang on a second. And I forgot to pull this up before. All right, so library viz at OSU. All right, and of course the one day I look at it, there we go. Um, so I need to sign in real quick, excuse me. All right, so this is, this is not it, but this is right here. Library viz at OSU, this is my Tableau public page. And I consider this a, a sandbox space. I have some um, visualizations that are up here that are ready to go, and then I have others that are, I admit, oh, freely admit are just some junk as I was trying to learn some features in Tableau, and other, there's other, some other projects that um, came out really cool, um, but I was like this human trafficking one down here, um, but I was really just trying to learn how to do, um, do um, word clouds and hidden windows in Tableau. But what I'm going to focus on right now is um, the gate count project, and I have, I don't want to spend too much time on this because I spoke about this project um, 
last year for a webinar for the Association of Research Libraries. Um, I have changed this visualization since then, though. Um, so this shows just daily traffic coming in and out of all library locations at the Ohio State University libraries. And the data is broken up in a couple of different ways so that um, for a couple of different purposes. And the default right now is all library locations on campus. I believe we have about 13 library locations total, but here are the big ones. And um, this first map, um, it looks cool up at the top, but it, um, you know, it doesn't really say much until you filter this particular year-over-year -year growth chart um, by one particular library. But if you notice, as I roll over, these little windows open, and these windows are called tooltips. They're a really neat feature in Tableau for adding um, context and narrative. Uh, to your visualizations. Um, I'm going to filter this chart right now and just say I really only care about our flagship library, the Thompson Library. So here's what I mean. It looks it's a little more meaningful when you only look at one library at a time. So our demand for our library, it's pretty um, dynamic, but you know, this year of year growth, you're going to want to see the the bar is kind of close to this zero line right here. We have uh, spark lines right here, um, which show the last calendar quarter traffic, and then a five-year trend for this library location. And then we can go down a dashboard or two up here at the top, and we can um, use some calculated fields to break up our gate count by our academic calendar year on this chart. And then this chart right here, dashboard three, our gate count is broken up by our calendar quarter, so and that is using Tableau's automatically built-in um, date algorithm. So that's really quick to uh, break up like a time series or a chart by quarter, month, or year. Don't really have to do any intermediary steps. So I like that. Um, I'm going to go back to my profile though, because again I've spoken about that before. I have another um, visualization here that's all of our live answers data, and this is looking at this back data back to 2013. And what I wanted to point out about this data is that um, I like to embed context into dashboards. So up at the top there's a little blurb about what data is in the dashboard, what's its purpose, and what kind of questions it might be able to answer for anyone who's using this data. And again, we have the data broken down by a line chart, we have it by a bar chart by quarter, um, we even have a, a cross tab up here, and you can limit this data to a select library location, such as our cartoon library or our veterinary medicine library, if you so choose. And then if we drill down onto another dashboard here, we have a heat map of our transactions by time of day, or um, just for the calendar year of 2015, um, time. Our li the time our librarians spend answering questions broken down by subject area at a broad level. And then lastly, I have this new um, dashboard that's called the REACH dashboard, and it's coming out of, it's actually driven by a Qualtrics survey that our library uses to collect all of our instructional data and our programming data. And I don't want to on this one either because um, I'm going to be presenting it at the library assessment conference in October. Um, but what's neat about this is it takes all of our course-related instruction data and it marries this data in the background to um, the university's master schedule of classes. And this has allowed us to go from having a um, database that had like 43 or 44 questions for our librarians to answer about their instructional activities to five because uh, we no longer need to ask them to provide things like the room the instruction was um, conducted in, the number of students who attended, because we, who was the primary instructor of record, et cetera, because we can pull all of this information directly um, from the university's master schedule of classes and join it with our own data, and that way we get more accurate data, and also we uh, simplify the reporting burden on our librarians. So this is an interactive dashboard. It, um, the top level here um, just summarizes everything in one place, but if you wanted an actual list of our one-shot instruction sessions, you can come right over here, click on that list, 
and you can see. So anytime you have a visualization in Tableau Public, keep in mind that the data that's driving that visualization needs to be publicly shareable data because every time I upload a dashboard to the system, it's actually going to Tableau servers. It's housed on Tableau servers. So I've shown you some examples of data that we report directly to the Association of Research Libraries, so it's not really viewed as private data right now here. Um, but um, that's just something to keep in the back of your head. And I just wanted to show you how these dashboards are put together real briefly. So if I go to the gate count dashboard, what I'm showing you right now is what it looks like in Tableau. This is the top level page. Each of these little graphs, um, and I'm not sure if you can see these on your end, but when I hover over them, um, a box will appear around the whole graph for last quarter calendar. If I go and I click here, I can go to the sheet and it shows you how this visualization was put together. Now I mentioned that Tableau is nice, it's a drag and drop software, anyone can learn to use it pretty quickly. Uh, it does take a little time and energy to learn to use it well. That said, Tableau offers many um, really good training tutorials on their website that you can freely watch. Um, there's a pretty robust Tableau community um, where you can post your questions to their boards. Um, a lot of the higher level uh, things that I've learned, for instance, this um, red dot right here is a um, calculated field and I, I borrowed it from someone in industry because I would have never figured out how to put that calculation together. But the reason that it's there is to show you um, when you roll over the data point, the last day that I downloaded the data, um, which was March 31st, 2016, um, because for this particular chart, um, while it is possible in Tableau to have data updated in real time, um, Ohio State doesn't have Tableau server, so I'm not able to use that feature at this time. Um, so I just, you know, download this. It, I'm a department of one. I download the data as often as I can. And so the last time I had an opportunity was for the um, first quarter data for this year. So I just wanted to communicate to my user group when I last downloaded the data, and I use a, a, a little trick there to um, show people how to do that. Now, in the spirit of works in progress, I wanted to show you um, a new project that I, well, not new, but a project I've been working on now for a little while, and it was, it came together based on a, um, another project that I, I shared, I think, at the Library Assessment Conference in 2014. I had um, worked with a, a group of my colleagues here at OSU to find some use cases for Tableau, and we were playing around with our Iliad data. Um, so we had connected Tableau to the Iliad server and was pulling, we're, we're extracting all of this data out, trying to figure out what might be useful for our subject librarians to inform their work with collections and other things. And um, we showed the results of that project to our um, collection strategist here who said, well, this is really great, I really appreciate it, but without the whole borrowing picture with OhioLink, it's not as, um, what's the word, um, useful for me or <clears throat> helpful. So um, now, um, and so because, you know, that question involved data that's housed in two different places. We have our Iliad data in one place, our OhioLink data in another. Um, it is possible in Tableau to blend data from disparate data sources, but you need a mean, something to match it up. So I embarked on this uh, project to parse out ISBN numbers so that I wouldn't have to um, I could make the data sets communicate directly without having to do an intermediary step, step like run it through OpenRefine or something. And I openly admit I haven't finished this project. Um, I haven't finished the, the getting the, um, the blending done. But I was able to use cal calculated fields in Tableau to parse out the ISBN numbers to get me a publisher name that is consistent. Um, and so um, that was pretty nifty. And it really is just a bunch of rules. So like um, first here, we have a, a Boolean statement that basically says if your ISBN starts with zero, let me know that it starts with zero. And then we have a, another calculated field here that takes the ISBN numbers and breaks them down. And it, it says, you know, if your ISBN number is, if you look at the number, the, la the first eight digits of that number and split off the, split off the first eight digits from the, um, left, 
float that number as a decimal, and then um, if it's between, you know, 9.5 million and 9.9 .9 million, then split it up this way and that way. Um, fun with string functions, but the the uh, end game here is that then you can create a combined set that says, hey, if your ISBN starts with this number equals true, then give me the ISBN starting with zero calculation, which then, I mean, this is what it looks like, but if I go to sheet two here, I'm sorry, sheet three, see it's it's chopped up all these numbers so that I can actually join it up with this publisher list that you see over here on the left. And so you know, now you know who the publisher is. So tested it a little bit. It's not perfect, but it, it catches, and especially when you get to like obviously higher level ISBN numbers, is kind of meaningless, but it, it can be done. So that was kind of fun and cool. So you need to take it to the next the next level. And um, and I have this other experiment um, here that does the same with um, LC call numbers. It uh, we wrote up some rules, borrowing some things that we already found that others have done on the internet, and I'm not ready to share this. It still needs a little bit of work, but um, I mean, share this broadly. But we wrote up some steps and some calculations that you can use to um, parse out IS Library of Congress call numbers so that we can then do some potential higher level analyses at a later date for our subject librarians or to support accreditation reviews or, or things like, um, I don't know, um, Funding requests for government funding, et cetera. So, um, so yeah, it's pretty neat. Um, so, a lot of things you can do with Tableau. A lot of potential. Um, this is just a um, like a high-level overview of what can be done with some of the simple, simple um, features and some of the uh, higher-level features. Um, but um, that's where we are today in um, Tableau at Ohio State. I am ready to turn the floor over to Sarah Tudesco. Okay, great. I'll, I'll take care of that. And while I'm doing that, uh, some people have started um, asking questions in chat, and I'd like to um, encourage people to uh, go ahead and continue to do that. Um, and also, just as a little tip, some of these um, windows can be kind of detailed and granular, and you can use, there's a little um, magnifying glass that's in your uh, viewing screen, and if you find that, you can zoom in um, to see a little more detail, and I'm sorry I didn't, uh, didn't mention that earlier. So, Sarah Murphy, looks like you're all set. Take it away. Or Sarah, Sarah Tedesco, sorry. Two, two Sarahs. The other Sarah, Sarah T. Well, thank you. I am Sarah T, and I'm excited to be able to talk to you today about some of the Tableau projects we're working at Yale, on at Yale. Um, like Sarah Murphy, I actually was introduced to uh, Tableau back in 2012. I actually enrolled in a data visualization class, and Tableau was one of a plethora of tools that we used to explore data visualization in that class. And it was very exciting because I could see some immediate application in the library environment. And because as part of the class, I got a six-month uh, free license to Tableau Desktop, I got a lot of time to explore library data within that particular product at that time. At Yale University Library, we're actually using Tableau Server in our environment. Um, the central IT office at Yale has purchased Tableau, and um, we are able to take advantage of that. And they provide us with a limited number of desktop licenses, as well as a development, a testing, and a production server environment, which is really incredible. It's a great place to, to do some experimentation, but it's also a protected environment with our permissions that are managed by our university's Active Directory system, which enables us to use data that's a little bit more sensitive than data that we would be able to publish on Tableau Public. So I'm going to sort of go over a few of the projects there, and I'm going to show you some behind the scenes of a little bit about how the sausage gets made and how I manipulated this data within some of these projects. Oh, hold on a minute. Okay. Yeah, okay, great. So I'm going to start with a project that I started working on with BorrowDirect. BorrowDirect is an unmediated resource sharing program that Yale participates in with um, 12 other, 12 institutions within the Ivy's Plus community. 
It was a project that was actually started in 1999 with three libraries, including Yale, Columbia, and Penn, but it's grown since for 12 institutions. And it is a very popular service here at Yale, and it's something that we're very interested in data for because it's such a popular program here at Yale. The Borrow Direct team, the people that manage this particular project, do provide a data repository and some data dashboards for, for this particular project. These were developed back in 2011, I believe, when the um, product moved to a new, a new system. So from, you know, there was a transition from one back-end system to another, and they built this particular data repository then. But as you can see, it's a, it's a pretty rudimentary data repository. It allows you to download data sets. It has a couple of very I'd say text-oriented dashboards that you can you can view and look at in sort of a in a, a cohesive way. However, this data was something that was really ripe for development with Tableau. Um, here's an example of a, a data extract that you deal with from the, the, the it's called the Metrodoc system for Borrow Direct, and it's just a simple Tableau, a just simple Excel spreadsheet, a CSV file with lots and lots of different data source data data fields that you can extract. Um, and what we did is I, I have been maintaining a sort of a side database version of this project for a long time in my work uh, at Yale to, to do analysis on Borrow Direct. And when we got access to Tableau, I built a Tableau uh, data dashboard. You're seeing here just a sort of a brief uh, screenshot of that particular dashboard. And we have developed and we're using this dashboard to tell a variety of stories for our institution for uh, a wide audience at our institution. So if you go, I'm going to just take a minute now and I'm going to share my screen so I can show you the live version of the dashboard. So just bear with me as I figure that out. All right. So you're now looking at a live version of the uh, Tableau dashboard. I've tried to blow it up a little bit so that people can see it. Um, it you could definitely also use that magnifying glass that was pointed out a little bit earlier. But the Tableau dashboard includes a variety of reports. The front page is really sort of the, the, the catch-all of almost all the basic information about BorrowDirect. As you can see, there are both borrowing and lending statistics, and both charts and graphs. So um, one of the things that I've sort of discovered about the audience here at Yale is um, I feel like they, they, they respond if there's both a visual element as well as sort of a traditional text element. So you'll see a lot of that in some of my examples and my data dashboards. Tableau is a product that works so well with data visualization. It's going back to sort of the normal numeric table environment is not, uh, is not always advised in Tableau, but I found that it's worked well in our particular projects. As you can see, I have a, a dynamic field that shows when the last time the various data has been refreshed. Um, so that's up here, and that's something that um, Sarah Murphy showed a little bit in her data dashboard. I figured out there was a little tip that I found on a, a data visualization blog on how to do that, and I've been doing that for a variety of my data sources. I like to link out to, um, we've been developing a lot of data sources that have um, live data connections, so it's good to see how often the data is being uh, updated. You'll see a borrowing table over here, and you'll notice that as I, as I hover over things, certain things will get highlighted. So if I hire, hover over Yale, you will see on the visualization that Yale is the largest uh, participant who, of this particular activity. We are the, we are the biggest borrower, borrower in this particular network. But as you can see, at a glance, you can see all of the libraries together. The other thing that you can see is our lending activity. The lending activity is not quite as interesting as the borrowing activity as far as line graphs are concerned, so I don't actually have a visualization of it. Um, there's a, a, an algorithm that tries to level out the, the activity at the different libraries, and so they're pretty steady state for the most part. Um, as you can see, that some libraries have just started participating in the program, so you'll see that there are blanks in some of the earlier years. And finally, I have a data visualization that shows what community 
uh, participants are using this particular service at all the different libraries. At a glance, um, uh, an administrator for all of these institutions can look and compare themselves against their peers to figure out like, like who are the biggest audiences in, in various institutions. So for example, Dartmouth College, which is the one university in this kind of group that doesn't have a large graduate student population, you see a distinct difference in the community that's using the Borrow Direct service. There's not a ton of interactivity on this particular dashboard, but um, in other views of the data, you can see additional information. So, oh, well, let me see. There's been a, a little bit of an error here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump out to, um, I'm gonna share my a different uh, file. But as you can see here. Um, we have the ability to create a dashboard that has additional information in it and a lot more detailed information. So this dashboard has a lot of different views and a lot of different things you can configure using the dynamic filtering uh, uh, features of Tableau. So for example, right now it's by default you're looking at Yale and you're looking at a particular overlay of the data. So for example, this is an overlay of the use of the, thing, the, the collections by our patrons what subject areas we're requesting, and um, sort of well, how do they compare against each other. So I can see, you know, so for particular groups of people, are faculty using more of that particular subject area than graduate students? There are other views that we can look at as well, and a dynamic overlay basically allows you to take the same data and sort of slice and dice it in a variety of ways. This particular slice shows local library availability. Our Borrow Direct system allows people to borrow items that are actually, there are copies on our campus, but um, that particular uh, copy may not have been available at the time, and so they brought, borrowed another copy of it from another library. You can also look at filled and unfilled rates, which is a, a, a very different type of an overlay on this particular data. So not only do you have the ability to switch out libraries here, so if I wanted to look at Harvard, I can just switch it off and look at the same data for Harvard, broken down in the same type of way. But the other thing is, is that I can go down a, a level deeper. So this particular chart is also a filter, so if I want to look at a more detailed view of what um, P uh, areas are being requested from Harvard, you can break down to another level of detail in the Library of Congress classification. So this is a good example of, of, of a uh, application with a variety of ways of looking at the data. I'm just going to jump back here. Okay. So um, one of the other great things about Tableau is it also allows you to do some self-service reporting, allowing um, our library community to use these reports in a variety of ways. Now, um, I had a, a request from somebody who wanted to look at collection gaps in um, the geology area, and she was interested in what people were requesting on BorrowDirect. I was able to point her to this dashboard, and even though the dashboard only went down to a certain level, I showed her how to go to the, get to the underlying data within Tableau and that allowed her to output that data into her own system so she could do additional analysis. So that's another feature that you can provide with Tableau is, is you can basically start exposing more data to the community that might want to dive deeper and they may not have been able to penetrate the data before. So I want to talk about um, a couple of things because this is a work in progress. And one of the things that's really important when you're developing dashboards is to think about how do you think about the audience of the dashboard. And um, this is an audience that is a pretty wide community. However, I kind of developed this on my own and I've been sharing it sort of piecemeal with different parts of the Ivy's Plus group. Is there a more effective way that we can collaborate on this project? And can we establish a link to a more current data set. Right now I have to output that data into Excel and I keep a repository of it. So moving on, I want to talk about another data dashboard that I developed. This was actually the first one I developed at Yale and it was for our LibGuides. Our LibGuides are something that we use to develop a variety of guides for subject areas, for various policies, for various procedures. It's a pretty uh, extensive database of LibGuides that we maintain, over, over 400. We have a wide uh, array of authors for those guides, almost over 50 authors. And one of the things we wanted to do was to provide a link to Google Analytics data for our LibGuides analysis. 
So as you can see, you saw a picture of one of our LibGuides, and we wanted to explore Google Analytics. We actually started this particular process by looking at Google Analytics itself and trying to develop a dashboard within that environment. But if anybody of you here has worked with Google Analytics data, you know Google Analytics is a complicated tool. It is a, a real bear to navigate when it comes to Lib Analytics, I mean LibGuides data, because you know each guide you have to sort of hunt and peck around all of the different areas of Google Analytics to get at the data that you want. And we thought that there would be an opportunity to bring this data into Tableau and present it in a more cohesive way to our audience. Um, LibGuides also has its own analytics dashboard. It's a lot simpler than Google Analytics. There's not as much data available within this particular uh, venue, but it's also something that you have to click around for. And our librarians never really seem to embrace going in here. Some did. It did kind of depend on the librarians. But it was, it was definitely kind of a cumbersome tool. And for some of our guides, it actually took a long time to process large swaths of data. So it was a little bit cumbersome in that way. So Tableau actually has a Google Analytics connector. That allows you to use the Google Analytics API to bring in um, a variety of measures into the system. It is a complicated, uh, Google Analytics is complicated, I already said that, and you have to be really careful as you're developing your Google Analytics dashboards to make sure that you're bringing the data in and aggregating it appropriately. So this was definitely the biggest part of our learning curve in this particular project. All right, and here's an example of our LibGuides dashboard. As you can see, this is a, a one-page view. Basically, you select a LibGuide, and you're going to get a variety of data about this particular guide. Um, I'm going to um, jump back out to show you a live version of this guide again, so just bear with me for just a second. All right. So here's our, our live version of our LibGuides. Now, this particular project had a very specific goal in mind. We really wanted the librarians to examine the LibGuides that they were responsible for as we thought about migrating from version 1 to version 2 of LibGuides. So we had a couple of things that we wanted them to look at as they thought about migrating guides or retiring guides, depending on which way they wanted to go. But as you can see, this is truly a dashboard, and it very much mimics Google Analytics, if you're familiar with that particular thing, where we highlight um, the page views, unique page views, users, seconds on page, and the bounce rate, and a nice sort of graph of the time uh, activity over time. What you're looking at right now is one of our main pages, the About the Library page. As you can see, you have the ability to, to change the date ranges up here. Now, this is the end date of LibGuides 1, so we're working on uh, LibGuides 2, one that will encompass this year's worth of data. But as you can see, this particular, we actually migrated on August 1st, so this data is from before the migration. We have a couple of quick pie charts that show sort of not only um, referral traffic, but also information about where the user is located. This was something that we were very interested in because we had found that some of our LibGuides were not actually being used by by Yale, New Haven people, it was being used somewhere else. Some of these guides had incredible reach on Google and were really heavily trafficked, but not necessarily for the focus community in which the guide was originally developed. We also um, set up event tracking on our LibGuides Google Analytics dashboard, and so we're able to tell what links people are clicking on, because LibGuides is really about it's usually a conglomeration of information about how to find the best resources in this various, uh, very specific subject areas, and we wanted to see which links people were actually clicking and going out to. The other thing about LibGuides that was really complicated is LibGuides is often um, a multi tabbed product, so you might, you might have a LibGuide with multiple tabs on it, and that was also very difficult to analyze in Google Analytics, but bringing that data in, coding it appropriately, we were able, for a complicated website, which is an um, example, excuse me while this refreshes, this particular one had, these, each one of these page titles actually represents one of the tabs, so you can kind of see how deeply somebody goes into a various LibGuide. We were trying to encourage librarians to simplify and not use as many tabs, and uh, we were really able to show, in some ways, a sharp drop-off in activity. So if you look at a, a, a popular guide, and I'm going to choose the one that you saw at the very beginning, our film research studies guide. This is one of our most heavily trafficked guides, but this is one of the ones where 
very few Yale people have ever actually used it. So that was one of the things we were highlighting when we were sort of going over this data with their different audiences. This was an example where we did something, this is really just one page, this is it. This is one page for each guide and it provided easy one-stop shopping for librarians to access this data. All right, I'm going to head back to my slides for just a moment. So, as you can see, this is also, even though this was a, a, the version one of this dashboard was sort of a work in progress, we are continuing our work on our Google Analytics dashboard. We want to expand this to other library properties. And we also want to um, look a little bit more closely at the analytics we're collecting, working with our user experience folks to come up with an even more effective set of measures for measuring the effectiveness of our web lib analytics and lib guides. So let me talk about a third major project that we've worked on. And this is, oh, this is an example of a project which is more of a one-stop project where we were sort of modeling a, a, a process. We were modeling a collection analysis project using a very specific subset of materials. This is the collections for Western European languages. That means we were analyzing our German language, our French language, and our Italian collections, really doing a deep dive into this particular process and all of the different aspects we could look at about these collections. And we were really interested in doing this, not only to analyze these collections, but looking at developing models going forward for a sort of a wider collection analysis template. So um, using our reporting tools for Voyager, this is the way that I access the collection analysis data. Our Voyager system is old and the reporting products for it are old. Here's Oracle SQL. It is um, a real old school system. You can get a lot of great data. There is a ton of data available. We have over 12 million bibliographic records. We have tons and tons of tables of circulation logs, acquisitions information, purchase order information, and almost everything else you can think of that's a part of your integrated library system, we have access to that data here. But getting at it and getting it um, in a, a position where it can be analyzed by a product like Tableau is a little bit of a challenge. I use Microsoft Access a lot, especially with some of my Tableau projects. It's kind of my go-to house for all of my data. It allows me to sort of bring data together in a way and keep it keep track of it in one place. However, I don't do a lot of visualization and analysis and access anymore. I tend to rely on other tools for it and access tends to be the house that holds the various data sources. This is an example of database that I used for the German language analysis. As you can see, there's lots of tables over here that show sort of the housing stuff, circulation data, the bibliographic data, information about patron groups, and other lookup tables that I've developed over the years to make collection analysis of MARC records easier and much more pleasant for the people that are consuming the reports so they don't have to puzzle through all of those wonderful codes. So we're looking at this particular project as a model for a more comprehensive project, but for um, one more demo, I'm going to jump right out, and then I'm going to show you this particular set of materials. There's a, a lot of data in this particular set of materials. All right, so here's our Western European Languages dashboard. As you can see, um, this is a basic overview of collection growth. Uh, over time, since the point of Voyager installation to now, we can see um, the different acquisitions rates. You can see the decline in acquisitions of our German language materials over the past 10 years or so. We can also see which countries these materials are coming from. The vast majority of these are from Germany. I use this particular metric because I work with some other international folks that have a much wider array of countries that they're getting from. So this particular visualization really changes depending on which view of the data you're looking at. When you're um, moving in a, an environment that allows you to have more than one sort of view of the data, you get this sort of tabbed environment, much, much like my complicated libguides, you have a tabbed environment in Tableau as well. So as you can see here, this is a breakdown of by format. So again, this is that translation of those OCLC codes into various formats. 
you can kind of get a breakdown by classification to see what collections we're really strong in. You can see here that we have a large legacy collection in our old Yale classification. So that's what you're seeing here. All of the newer materials are cataloged in Library of Congress, and that started in the mid-80s. We have not gone back to reclass the old stuff, and a lot of that stuff is starting to get migrated out to the library shelving facility. One of the things we were very interested in is the usage of these collections by our patron group, and this brings in our Voyager circulation data. And this is Voyager circulation data only for German language materials. So as you can see, you can really sense the pattern over time. And um, one of the things that's really notable about these collections is the only group that was really growing is our resource sharing group. And of course, that's the material we're lending out on the Borrow Direct, coming full circle from the first uh, view that we were looking at, and through traditional interlibrary loan schemes. It is pretty much the only group that has grown over the past 10 years. And we've been seeing a real sharp decline in unsigned some of the usage of these collections by our primary communities, which are our graduate students and our faculty members. One of the other metrics that I'm using the data to calculate is I'm also calculating the circulation frequency. So this is the idea is we have something on the shelf. What is the likelihood that that material is going to get circulated? And as you can see here, our German language materials, the stuff that saw it on the shelf the longest, the stuff that was acquired in 2003, has the highest um, rate of circulation, meaning about 17% of that material was touched by a patron. And that means that um, over 80% of that material has never been touched by a patron. Then what's the likelihood that that material is ever going to be used by a patron at Yale or even in our wider borrow direct community? It's a really interesting question. So this particular dashboard shows this in a variety of ways. Over here, you're seeing about the year that we acquire the materials, and that's why you see that the sharp, the orange declines precipitously because this stuff hasn't been on the shelf for barely six months, you know, the likelihood that it's gone out is it's much lower than stuff that's been around for a while. Down here you see our pre-2002 acquisitions, and this, this includes a lot of the stuff that's classed in our old Yale, and this also includes a lot of stuff that has not been captured by circulation. This stuff has been on the shelves for a long time. It was probably maybe have been manually circulated. We really don't know. It's kind of a mystery. So this is a material I like to say that we don't know a lot of information. For the stuff acquired in 2006, I can say definitively whether or not that's been out. If it was acquired in 1954, I, I have less confidence in saying that. Over here, you can get a, an idea of the circulation sort of frequency by date of publication. Um, like so many of our collections, even our very traditional collections like this, the, the more recent materials from the past 20 or 30 years are a little bit more popular than the, the really old stuff. So you're seeing that activity here. This bar represents the total amount of material that was published during that time period, during that decade. And that also kind of gives you an idea of like during the war, you know, the, there's been a, there was a drop off in German publications acquired by the library and then you can kind of see the changes. And then you see sort of the, the real sort of robust acquisitions period in the 90s and the early 2000s before the initial crash of 2001 when budgets were really, really rich, you know, you saw a big rise in and activity and acquisitions activity in that particular period of time. And then finally, oh, then it moves on, and then we see stuff in French. So as you can see, um, this particular uh, collection, basically we use the same template for all of the different language collections. So those are sort of the, um, the three major ones I wanted to show you. Um, one more work in progress that I wanted to mention before we left and, and moved into our question and answer section is this is something that we're working on right now. And this is our electronic resources project where we're trying to take the data to develop a data dashboard for our counter statistics. Um, we have an antiquated system of uh, basically creating this huge website of all of these published reports that we refresh by hand every six months. And um, it has been an, a, a very difficult system to, make, um, to sustain. So we've moved into a new system where um, we've bought some proprietary uh, licenses to some proprietary software and we're moving into a different environment, but we want to explore looking at this data within Tableau because Tableau offers us the ability to 
combine this data set with more financial data to be able to do things like cost per use and that type of activity. And this is a really good example of, of a, a project that we're working on with a group of people. And we're really sort of analyzing what the user needs are for this particular dashboard before we do a lot of intense development. So it is um, a work in progress, but you know, Tableau does offer, here's a more like a, just a data dashboard, but it allows you, you can put search fields in there, you're allowed to limit, you can, you can organize and clean up provider information. And this is something that um, we're lo really looking forward to being able to establish better metrics because over 70% of our budget goes to these materials and we as a group really need to be able to analyze these more effectively. So these are some of the things we're looking at as we're analyzing this work in progress, what the audience really wants. And what our audience really wants is they want, they want cost data, they want baselines, and they want guidance and help interpreting this data. And that's one of the things that Tableau can really help with. As you visualize this data, you can provide a lot of anchors and clues and documentation about what this data means and what, how to put it into context. And that's one of the real powers of data visualization. So um, that's it for my demonstration. So I want to turn it back over to Mary Lee and OCLC for questions. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, we've had a number of uh, questions. I just wanted to throw up the um, contact information there uh, in case people want to note down the Sarah's contact information. Also get to see a picture of Sarah T. Um, so we had a couple of questions as we were going along. Um, one of them was, uh, what data warehouse solution do you use? Either one of you. Okay. Well, I can start. This is Sarah Tedesco at Yale. Um, we have um, we have access to a Canvas data warehouse. It's a, a pretty robust system, but we don't have much library data in that particular data warehouse other than financial data. So we are basically sort of maintaining a lot of data sources on our own, and we don't really have a comprehensive data warehouse process for library data at this point. This is Sarah M. This is it's the same here at OSU. Okay. Um, we have a question about uh, Google Analytics. Have you run into issues with Google Analytics only providing sample data as opposed to the full data set? And I guess, um, Sarah T, this is a question for you. Sarah, Sarah Murphy, you may have also used uh, Google Analytics, but I think, Sarah um, T, you were the person who talked most about that. That is a great question, and the answer is yes, I have run into that particular issue. When you bring in, um, because the Google Analytics API has, has some, some, some hard limits in it, um, they, they, you will sometimes find when you bring that data into Tableau, all of a sudden you'll get a little note that the data has been sampled. So one of the things that I've done to get around that is I can do, I can, you can play with the dates of data import, and that's been successful for my data, where if I bring in a more limited set of data, it won't be sampled, and then I, I bring in a limited set, and then I append onto it. So basically I'm housing the data outside of the Google Analytics area. I have embedded it in Tableau at that point, but you can develop some scripts and some mechanisms, and there's a lot of tutorials on how to do this. If you look at Tableau and Google Analytics, because other people have definitely run into this as well. So that, that's how, how I've managed it. Okay. Um, here's another question. Uh, why do you take the data out of the Voyager database and put it into Access before pulling it into Tableau? Is there a way to go directly from Voyager to Tableau? That is a great question. And the answer is, is that I often do this because um, I'm, I want to work with a subset of the Voyager data, and I'm also doing some additional cleanup and sort of merging the data with other sources. But I can tell you that I am very much looking into looking into connecting directly to the Oracle data. The Oracle connector, because our Oracle system is 
so old, has, has run into a, a few problems. And one of the problems that I run into with Tableau, when you're connecting out live to very large data sets, you can have response issues. And so one of the ways around that is to do some, some fancy stuff on the data, the Tableau server side to sort of streamline it, to extract the data, to sort of warehouse it within Tableau. And that's the stuff that I am experimenting with. I can tell you that I'm working on additional projects, bringing in data from our Atlas systems. This includes Iliad, which I think Sarah Murphy uh, mentioned, but um, what the big one that I'm working on right now with our special collection folks is bringing in Aon data, and we're working directly with live connections to our Atlas system, which is a Microsoft SQL environment. Okay, great. Um, here's another question, and this could be uh, for, for pretty much anybody, but I wonder if either of the Sarah's has a response to it. Um, does anyone have experience using Microsoft's Power BI service as an alternative to Tableau? I just started playing around with smaller data sets. It's free for data sets under one gigabyte. It seems very easy to use. So this session was on data visualizations. It wasn't meant to be um, uh, on, on Tableau. It just happens to be that that's the tool uh, that both, both of you are using. But um, there's uh, another alternative for people who might be looking to just kind of get their feet wet. And I don't know if either one of you have taken a look at it. Yeah, this is Sarah Murphy. Um, I regularly attend, regularly attend the Tableau Users Group here in Columbus, and some of my colleagues out in industry uh, mentioned that you know they use Tableau, but they have issues at at their play, at their institutions because it, it it's it's not a matter of it, it's, it, there are so many data visualization tools out there. I made a conscious decision that I was going to learn to use Tableau um, because of the just the time required to become pretty proficient at it. And so I just really I dabbled around in Many Eyes, which now has a new name. I dabbled around in some other other tools, but I decided to um, focus my time and energy on on learning Tableau. So I have not used Power BI. Uh, this is Sarah T, and um, I have used earlier iterations of the Microsoft uh, Business Intelligence Suite. Um, it's, a, it's actually a product that we have had established here at the library, so we actually do have some data and reporting in that area as well. The newer version does look very interesting, and I think that it's always important to look at a suite of tools because there are things that Tableau is good at, but there are things that Tableau is not good at. And a lot of that sort of text-based data that I was showing in some of my visualizations is a good example of that. And some of the Microsoft products are a little bit better in that area. I've also played a little bit with um, the D3 suite of products, which is a, a great sort of data visualization suite. Um, that's, I think, something that came out of Stanford as well, which I think actually Tableau did as well. So, so it sort of it kind of all lives there. But um, I think that there are so many different products, and I still do a lot of data visualization within Microsoft Excel. Um, one of the great things about the earlier versions of Power BI that I used with, uh, with the Microsoft products was its ability to deal with large data sets. And, you know, I, because uh, the institutions I've been working at the last few years have been very large, you know, you often run into real the real limits of some of the more traditional desktop tools. And Power BI really was able to handle that large data set so much more effectively. And Tableau does in a very similar way. Great. Um, what about data cleaning? Um, is there any kind of formula you use when you're, when you're cleaning up your data? I use several. Um, I've borrowed a lot. There's a um, Tableau King James Bible on Freely available on the internet, and it, it's a great provides a lot of great examples of how to clean and parse string data. And so um, I do a lot of my I made a conscious decision to force myself to learn how to clean data in Tableau, just because my long-term interest is to pull the data directly from a server and then and then use it without having to take an intermediary cleanup stop um, elsewhere. Um, so um, Yes, I use formula almost exclusively, and I borrow the um, formulas um, from other sites on Tableau. If um, I can find an Excel formula for cleaning up string data, I usually can um, translate that Excel formula into a Tableau formula. So I, I do that often. 
I see a question here about why I converted the ISBN numbers to floating rather than using string functions to parse out the data. Um, that's a type conversion issue in Tableau um, because I was looking at num numbers um, and I was using numerical functions such as left. Um, you have to use, um, I had to float the number because it wasn't 9.5 9 million is a number, it's not a string. So. I had to convert it. I had to convert the number. My data was in a string format, but I had to convert it into a number format so that Tableau could perform the logical function. Great. Um, suggestions on data visualization workshop. Looks like D3. Oh, D3 is actually, uh, that's a data visualization tool. I just put in a link oh, okay. to data visualization oh, workshop that you. I did from, um, this was at Harvard Extension School, and it's something that's offered online and is offered periodically. I'm not sure when the next session is, but it was a, a really incredible uh, uh, sort of a semester long presentation of data visualization. It included keeping a data visualization diary. I had to learn how to draw, which is really important. My artistic skills are, are, are minimal at best, and it was some, a good way to sort of activate that part of my brain. And it's really, you know, if you have people that are good with um, sort of the visual elements, I encourage you to get them on your team because um, I'm good with numbers and I'm good with that type of thing, but having somebody who's good with the, the visual elements can really help to sort of flesh out your data visualizations and make them beautiful. And that's one of the things I'm working on this next year. We're, we're going to be giving a, uh, a pre-conference for the library assessment conference in October of this year, uh, a, a hands-on class on how to use Tableau, going to be about three hours long, and it, it's going to be taught by myself, Rachel Llewellyn at UMass Amherst, and Jeremy Bueller up at University of British Columbia, so there'll be an opportunity there. Um, I've kind of self-taught on Tableau, but I regularly attend uh, the Columbus Tableau Users Group. I also head the Ohio State University's Tableau Users Group, and that's really helpful going to see how other 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 people, especially other people in other fields, are using their data and putting dashboards together. Tableau often has a Tableau has a gallery when you first open your Tableau desktop editor. Um, to the right there's a gallery of image of of visualizations that you can look at. And so if you see a data visualization in Tableau public that you really like, you can always download that visualization and look to see how that visualization was put together. I've, I've learned a lot of really good tips doing that. Um, Tableau also has a customer conference annually, and it's, it's, it's I wouldn't compare it directly to a, um, like a typical library conference because there's a lot of educational opportunities embedded directly in the conference that are hands-on, um, and you just, you don't have to, sign up ahead of time to to go or um, have a special registration. It's, it's just part of your conference registration fee. I've also, um, I went to the Tableau customer conference in 2012 and uh, they have this little program called Tab the Tableau Doctor and so I took a data set or, or a visualization I was having some trouble with and I sat down one-on-one -on -one with one of their engineers and uh, they helped me fix my, fix my issues. So there's a really good Tableau community out there that can help you uh, learn and grow and become a, a better um, um, crafter of data visualizations. Hey, well we are, we have reached, it's hard to believe, this has been such a, a rich um, session but we've reached the end of the hour. Uh, so I want to thank you both, Sarah Murphy and Sarah Tedesco, for uh, sharing your wisdom and your experience and bravely also sharing your actual works in progress. Uh, we look forward to, to hearing back from you. Maybe we could have you back as our first repeat visitors for the Works in Progress seminar. Um, uh, so thanks so much to all of you. This session has been recorded and I will be sharing a link with all of you uh, either before the end of this week or at the beginning of next week. So thanks a lot and I hope you tune in next time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.